Hello, thank you. I'm Helen from the Maritime Archaeology Trust. We're based in Southampton. And I'm going to be talking about one of the projects we are currently working on. The D-Day Stories from the Wall project is digitally preserving World War II graffiti left by soldiers shortly before boarding the ships that would take them into combat. The project is funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. It began in April last year and will run until the end of this year. The project came about following local concern that the wall was eroding and it ties in nicely with two significant anniversaries. The 75th anniversary of D-Day last June and the 75th anniversary of VE Day coming up in May. I will give you some background to World War II and what was happening in Southampton at that time and then move on to explain the significance of the wall and the inscriptions. World War II was declared on the 3rd of September 1939. As in the First World War, Southampton would once again play a major role in the movement of troops overseas. On the 9th of September, only six days after the declaration, the British Expeditionary Force sailed from Southampton to Cherbourg. But following the fall of France, the British Army had to be evacuated from Dunkirk and many of the men would return back via Southampton. Southampton was also home of the Spitfire, designed by Reginald Mitchell working at the Supermarine Aviation Works. Allied success in the Battle of Britain put pay to Hitler's plans to invade. And during the Blitz, June 1940 to June 1942, Southampton docks were closed. The docks, together with the Supermarine and other factories, were strategically bombed by the Luftwaffe. 57 attacks were launched on the city, with 45,000 buildings destroyed or badly damaged. The docks were heavily bombed, the Supermarine factory was virtually destroyed during two daylight raids, and the High Street was obliterated. Limited planning for an Allied invasion of Europe had begun after the Dunkirk evacuation, and by 1943 detailed plans were forming. South Western House Hotel was requisitioned by the Royal Navy in 1942 as a shore-based training establishment for combined ops, known as HMS Shrapnel. Churchill and Eisenhower are known to have met here on at least one occasion to determine the roles GB and US would play. Operation Neptune was the code name for the seaborne part of the D-Day invasion. Southampton was identified as a key port. On D-Day, British Force G would sail from Southampton to Gold Beach. And Force J, which included the Commandos and Canadians, would sail from the River Hamble and Stokes Bay to Juneau and Sword Beaches. The American Army would leave from Portland, Weymouth and Dartmouth and sail to Omaha and Utah. After the last major air raid in June 1942, the docks were reopened to receive lend lease cargoes from America. This included a wide range of vehicles as well as food. Secret construction of the Mulberry Harbours began in 1943, with component parts being built all along the south coast. Two of the Phoenix caissons were built in Southampton. These were to be towed over to Normandy following the landings and sunk to form harbours with roadways that would enable the landing of heavy equipment and supplies. As part of the planning, the US 14th Major Port took control of the docks, effectively turning Southampton into one big military camp. Offices were set up in the Civic Centre, the officers were billeted in hotels, and soldiers camped in Nissen huts on the city's parks. The Americans were segregated by colour, and to ensure peace between them and the locals, they even bought their own military police force. And in this photo, you can see three of the snowdrop helmets. Dalton Newfield, this guy down at the bottom, was a provost marshal in the port and he was a keen photographer. He left behind a large collection of photographs, mostly showing his friends at leisure around the city. And it is strange to see the American service personnel posing by the city's medieval walls, often with American vehicles in the background. Both Dalton and his friend, Lieutenant Booser, met their future wives in Southampton. Jack Booser met American Red Cross nurse Grace Waite and Dalton met Eleanor Clausen from London. Eleanor was among the 70,000 British war brides who would depart from Southampton at the end of the war. From March 1944, British and Canadian troops began to move into the area. Vehicles lined the streets, radiating out miles from the waterfront. Camouflage nets were strung across the roads between the trees to hide them. Every side street was packed too, and householders were encouraged to let the men use the facilities. One local resident, Jan Caesar, who was 15 years old at the time, recalled, 
My mother took pity on the men who were desperately tired and had been forced to sleep in their lorries. She invited several into our home where they crashed out on beds and chairs. During the day, the men would move off for training exercises, but in their free time, soldiers enjoyed mingling with the locals and especially the children, much to their delight. With cries of, got any gum, chum? Match with the popular retort, got a sister, mister? Oral histories recount the delight of the local population. From mid-May 1944, the docks closed again, this time to allow the assembly of the invasion fleet. Craft of all descriptions filled the river inlets and docks all along the coast. And then the order came, it was time to go. Due to the weather delay, many ships had already loaded and anchored out in the Solent overnight. The remaining men boarded ships at the three embarkation hards that had been built specially at the waterfront. On D-Day itself, two thirds of the British assault force left from Southampton. There was nobody to wave them goodbye. They left so early in the morning and the locals had been so used to seeing the men leave on exercise, the people didn't actually know the invasion had happened until the news broke later in the day. And then we have this famous picture of, an Ameri of the Americans uh, getting off the landing craft and wading ashore to Omaha Beach. So although these are Americans, this scene was repeated all along the Normandy coast. I think that's a very poignant picture. But that was only the beginning for Southampton. Later that day, the wounded began to return. And in the days following throughout the rest of the war, German prisoners would arrive at Southampton to be processed before being sent to camps throughout the UK. Troops continued to flow from Southampton to France throughout the war. The American replacement soldiers began to leave from Southampton too. A counter kept track of the men walking up the gangway and a ceremony was held for the millionth Yank, Paul Shimmer from Pennsylvania in October, 1944. Three and a half million men passed through Southampton during World War II, more than two million American, one million British and 5,000 Canadian. There is little in the city to tell of the Americans' role, except a plaque on the Pilgrim Fathers' Memorial at the waterfront, which reminds us that whilst the Pilgrim Fathers departed from the same spot to seek freedom, their ancestors returned to fight for ours. A section of brick wall in Western Esplanade bears the inscriptions of almost 100 American soldiers who passed by. We're lucky to have a volunteer artist, Mike Greaves, who painted this lovely impression of the soldiers carving their names whilst waiting at the wall. The project title refers to the D-Day Wall. This is as it is recorded in historic environment record. However, of the dates we have found, the majority are actually after June, more likely August to December. As you see here, the top picture, Martin Carter from New York was here in August 1944. And slightly harder to read below, Billy Davis from Kentucky was here in December the 22nd, 1944. And that seems to be quite a common date. We've seen quite a few of those. These men were replacements sent to strengthen the numbers following the losses incurred during D-Day. These men would find themselves in combat at the Battle of the Bulge in the Ardennes in December. Today, this wall forms the boundary of the staff car park of the Leonardo Royal Grand Harbour Hotel at the lower end of Western Esplanade. It's just a short walk from there round to the embarkation hards at the waterfront. The wall is marked on the 1948 OS map as being the boundary wall of the city mortuary and clinic. This 1946 aerial photo shows the complex well. The wall on the right hand side has been demolished and the wall we are recording is on the left hand side. Just off for this picture just over here, there were some houses that have been demolished now. Uh, they were called Forest View and bricks saved from those houses have been incorporated into this project too. So what we see today is a 19 metre long surviving section. It is not listed, but it is registered with the Imperial War Museum as a war memorial. The historic environment record contains photos taken by Southampton City Council in 1993 prior to demolition. There are fil film photos pre-digital, so the resolution is not as high, but by zooming in, quite a few of the indescribed bricks can be deciphered. And some of these bricks were saved and built into this small wall in the car park behind. 
The inscriptions were probably carved with an army knife. Some are very deep, indicating the person was here for a while. Others are not much more than a quick scratch. And you can see the army knife stored in the backpack there. Each inscription is very unique and it is remarkable how close some of the inscriptions are to the handwriting on their draft cards. Each has a different style. Some are more elaborate than others with lots of arrows, curves, anchors and uh, Eddie Mayer even seems to have drawn a landing craft. The most elaborate brick was carved by Sidney Greenwald. It begins with an anchor and it says, on way to France, Sydney Greenworld, here's his, his serial number, Bronx, New York, USA. Fortunately, this brick was rescued from the demolished houses and is kept in museum collections. Every time we go to the wall, we see something different. It depends on the amount of water the wall is holding from rising damp and whether the surface is wet from rain and how long it's been raining. Also, the intensity and angle of the sunlight, which obviously changes throughout the day. Frost and moss can also obscure or, obscure or enhance the inscriptions. Volunteers play a vital role in this project. So far, more than 50 have been involved in identifying and recording the inscriptions, either by eye or through photographic recording. Other volunteers research the names or follow up particular angles of the story and visit archives to gather photos and documents. I've seen many of the volunteers being really drawn into this project and at one of the recording sessions when interviewed by ITV, Mike put it very succinctly. Putting your fingers on the initials of someone who carved that all those years ago and knowing where they were going to is quite emotional. You are terrified you are going to miss someone's name. Many of the inscriptions are clearly visible to the naked eye 75 years on. Others are eroding and require photographic techniques to be able to capture and interpret them. In order to try not to miss any, we will be using RTI photography to capture and interpret inscriptions that are not visible by eye. This gravestone image by Archivision is a good example of what we hope to achieve. So where do you start with a project like this? We began by taking our own initial survey, just writing down any names we could see on the wall. We then consulted the HER, which had those photos. Southampton City Council Archaeology and Heritage Collections had a survey that had been done by a volunteer a few years ago. Also some slides from the 80s. And online, there was quite a lot of local knowledge too. People had written on Facebook posts about the wall and written the names that they too could see. From this, we drew up an initial list of names and plugged those names into the internet at various sites to see what would come back. So when I first went to the wall, the first name that really jumped out at me was Kurt Hodges, Chicago, Illinois. I put Kurt Hodges WW2 into Google and straight away up came an obituary entry. That had a lovely photo of him in wartime uniform, a more recent photo, and it told us that he'd only passed away in 2017. It also mentioned that he was one of the heroes who survived the Battle of the Bulge. So again, this was confirming what we'd seen with some of the dates that this was post D-Day. A bit more digging and we found a funeral service sheet with the full size photo, showing him there in quite thin looking clothing in deep snow and also a newspaper article, which actually mentioned that Kurt served with the 424th Regiment of the 106th Infantry Division. But a real breakthrough came with the discovery of this roster. This roster shows Company M of the 106th Infantry Division, 424th Infantry Battalion. It shows that Kurt was a motor transport corporal in the 3rd Platoon. And over time, we've been able to match a further six names from the wall to this list and I will mention more about those men shortly. Often in archaeology, we're quite removed from the individual people, and although it wasn't originally intended, we're now making direct links with sons, daughters, and grandchildren of these men, 
We wish we could do it for all, but sadly some are just improving impossible to narrow down. For the volunteers, being able to make these connections brings an enormous sense of achievement and satisfaction. And quotes like this from the families show that they're extremely grateful for these discoveries. Having discovered Kerbs with 106, we went on to research the division to discover their fate. The 106 were formed in South Carolina in 1943. They were the last division formed and were intended to be an elite military unit. They had spent the winter in Tennessee for winter training, then moved to Camp Atterbury, Indiana, ready to be posted overseas. Here, the division suffered a blow as some of the most experienced men, up to half the company, were redeployed. The complement was hastily filled with new recruits, many of whom were young college men on the AST program, not expected to be in combat. Others were reassigned from the Air Force or Coast Guard. The division that left America was made up of 12,000 men, with the majority assigned to one of the three infantry regiments, 422, 423 or 424. Their average age was only 21. Military historians are constructing a roster for the whole of the 106th Division, and from that we have so far found a further five names, bringing the total to 12 members of the 106th. This photograph shows Company M, which was the company Kurt was in, shortly before leaving America. Sergeant Ralph Weiss, it was with the 424, and he wrote a very detailed account of his World War II service. And here at this part, he tells of his arrival in England. He says, in October 1944, they were sent to Boston, where they boarded either the Queen Elizabeth or the Aquitania. They landed at Gorak in Scotland and took trains to the Cotswolds, where they were to be billeted in the villages. On the 2nd of December at 1 a.m. in the morning, they boarded a train to Southampton. The train arrived at 5 a.m. and they walked down the waterfront and waited in sheds. It must have been at this time as they walked past the wall that they decided to carve their names, an age-old military tradition. As you will discover later, Delbert was certainly here a little while. This is him over here. Yep. All of these inscriptions are quite deep and still clearly visible by eye. My interpretation of the spacing is that this was a conscious decision by this group of 12 men to stand in the line and carve their names, and they seem to spend some time doing so. So it starts off with Delbert up here, Ralph in the middle, William Muller from New York, Kurt Hodges, Chicago, Illinois, Robert Golden, William Knights, Walter Shirk, Bill Roby, Ken Colby, John Calliff, Johnny Johnson, and Jack Kelly. At 9 a.m. they boarded the ships, but they had to wait at anchor for the safety of darkness. They sailed to La Havre, where they hit a storm, and it took some time to get all the men off the ships onto shore. They took trucks through France to saint Viet in Belgium, where they arrived on the 9th of December. They had arrived in the worst winter on record, and some of the more recent recruits still had only summer clothing. This was going to be a quiet area where they would regroup and rest. But on the 16th of December, they were woken by intense shelling and then began five weeks of deadly combat, the Battle of the Bulge. If you've seen the Band of Brothers episode, this is the Bastogne episode where they're in the foxholes in the dense forest. This was Hitler's last offensive and America's biggest infantry battle. Two of the three battalions, the 422 and the 423, were encircled and surrendered. And this was when Golden and Knights, who both wrote on the wall, were captured and taken prisoner of war for the remainder. The 424th held their position for five days until they could be relieved. They spent the rest of the war guarding German prisoners of war and carrying out border, border patrols in Germany. Incredibly, all 12 of these men on the wall survived and returned home at the end of the war. A particularly poignant story emerged from the research into one of the inscriptions, D.W. Smith, Miss. Delbert Wayne Smith was recorded on the roster with Ch Kurt Hodges as a driver with the 3rd Platoon, and this was confirmed by looking on the 106th Association database. The 1940 census shows Delva, aged 17, as an unpaid worker on the family farm. He lives with his parents, five siblings, and a grandfather. Our researcher discovered this lovely photo online, which shows Delva, third from left, with his siblings. 
His US Army registration card shows Delbert, now aged 19, still working on the family farm in Itawamba, Mississippi. On his enlistment papers, dated March 1943, he's recorded as married. Delbert had married Ethel Klaus in October 1941. The name Ethel rang a bell. There are a few ladies' names on the wall. And when I went back to look, Ethel was right next to Delbert, with the word wife above. It's clear to see now that wife and Ethel are linked, and Nonnie Morgan is a separate inscription. We made contact with a relative through Ancestry, who sent a photo of Ethel, and her daughter Nina. Another light bulb moment, another trip back to the wall. And now daughter Nina was clear to see too. And here you can see the whole group. So we've got daughter Nina, wife Ethel, D.W. Smith, Miss Mississippi, USA. Delbert clearly had his family at the forefront of his mind as he waited to embark. Delbert returned home and had three more children, spending the rest of his life in Itawamba. Sadly, he died on their 64th wedding anniversary, aged 82. Ethel died nine years later. Their headstones are joined with the words, love never ends. So far, we have found three men who were killed in action. Two were repatriated, but Sergeant Bill Urban from Chicago lies in the American Cemetery at Luxembourg. Bill joined the 4th Armoured Division, 24th Engineer Battalion, and died of wounds sustained in the advance on the Rhine, March 16, 1945. He was awarded the Bronze Star and the Purple Heart. Our volunteer researcher first made contact with his family, coincidentally, on Thanksgiving Day last year. They said, today is Thanksgiving, and we, the Urban family, are saying thank you for this special gift. The same researcher was in Luxembourg a few weeks later, commemorating the 75th anniversary of the Battle of the Bulge and visited his, his, visited his grave to lay a cross etched with words chosen by the family and was able to send them a photo. Today, I have only mentioned a few of the men and a few of the units involved. All of the information is being uploaded into our interactive 3D viewer. It is still a work in progress and needs updating following the research which is continually coming in. But by selecting a name, the model will zoom in on the inscription and by navigating the tabs will display the story of the man together with all the other information we have been able to gather, whether it's photographs or newspaper articles. It is hoped this website will not only honour these men and preserve their stories, but also be of use to World War II researchers and people researching their family history. Another important aspect of the project is to share this knowledge with the general public and tell the story in the city and beyond. New activities have been produced for the Maritime Discovery Bus, which attends events throughout the year. The activities include a water tank with Lego-style landing craft for children to sail to and from D-Day beaches, with World War II photographs to show them what it was really like. Children can also imagine they were a soldier passing the wall and design their own brick. There's a quiz sheet to help people at the wall guide them to the inscriptions. A set of banners is also touring different venues around the city, and a permanent set is kept in the hotel foyer. A geocache also leads visitors to the wall, and these are very popular with cruise ship passengers, many of whom are American. We also work with Sea Southampton tour guides to pass on these stories of the men and the wall on their tours. Southampton schools have all received a link to download our D-Day wall educational booklet, and we have been running in school workshops. Following a Facebook post about one school trip to the wall, we received lovely feedback from Kathy in America. She said, my grandfather left up here for the 106th headed to the front lines. He wouldn't make it back home. He was buried in Belgium. You can't know how it warms my heart to see that these youngsters are learning about them and their sacrifices. And finally, in May 2019, it was a great honour to welcome World War II veterans with the Greatest Generations Foundation. All were aged in their mid to late 90s and a couple into their hundreds. They arrived on the Queen Mary II and were en route to the commemorations in Portsmouth before sailing over to France for the D-Day 75th commemorations. All of these men had sailed from the West Country on D-Day, but they were surprised to see how well the traces of their fellow soldiers had survived and were pleased to know that they are still remembered in Southampton. If you would like to discover more about these stories, please visit our website, www.maritimearchaeologytrust.org, 
forward slash D-Day Walls and also follow our social media channels. Thank you for listening. That just leaves me to pass the baton all the way down under to Dr. Ian McCann at the University of New England in Australia, who will be talking about Vietnam's shipwreck coast next Tuesday.